Good evening, Munich. Yeah. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> All right? Okay, like I know it's been a long day, so we're going to go into the most important topic of the day today, which is diversity and inclusion in the startup industry. So let's just get started. Before I talk about why diversity and inclusion matters in the industry, I want to talk a little bit about my personal story and why it matters to me. 20 years back, when I first went to San Francisco as an immigrant from India, the first thing I realized was that I looked different, I spoke differently, and I was also, funnily enough, I was completely, ha my hair was different, like it's all Bollywood and like a lot of hair and not really what you would call like business attire. And then I realized that not only do I feel different, I didn't feel that I really belonged when I ended up like talking to my customers and my clients trying to sell software. That was a fundamental part of my lifestyle for a few years till I was able to get over it. And now I'm on the other side of the table. I meet entrepreneurs, women and minorities. I feel a strong kinship to them in terms of the struggles that they are facing. Because they are facing big challenges. Let's face it. And we probably know some of those challenges at a high level in terms of the challenges that they have in terms of getting funding, getting access to capital from venture capitalists. We also know that they have limited access to mentor networks that open doors for them, either in terms of business collaboration or in terms of partnerships or new customers. And finally, there's a huge lack of diversity in the VC ecosystem that contributes to the lack of funding and the lack of mentorship. Let's just double click on each one of these things because let's understand what the problem is before we can find a solution to it. One, access to funding. Less than 13% of the VC funding in the US goes to a startup that's founded by at least one women co-founder. Now, if you take all women startups, that number drops down to 2.2%. That's pretty shocking, and women are 50% of the population. And if you look at black, Latino, Latina entrepreneurs, the numbers are even lower. So there's a fundamental bias in investing in women and minority entrepreneurs in the US. Europe's no different. You look at Europe, like what's going on in Europe is that less than 7% actually goes to women startups, at least with one women co-founder. Less than 2% of VC funding in Europe goes to startups, which are all women. And you look at these numbers at an aggregate, and you realize that there's a huge problem in the industry that we are not solving today actively. Then you go to this whole access issue in terms of mentorship and customers. You have seen, and we have also seen, that less than over 48% of women founders say that they lack the advisors and mentors that can help them, and that's holding them back. Now, if you talk about women of color, that number jumps up to 62%. That means 62% of women of color feel that lack of mentors is holding them back. Now, this obviously comes from the business world also, right? So if you talk to women in the business world, they feel that 24% of them are less likely than men to get advice from senior leaders in their company. So you have a fundamental structural problem in terms of mentorship, and these mentors are the people who open doors. These are the ones that really help these startups to scale, and we have that big problem. But then you look at the lack of diversity in the venture capital ecosystem, the numbers are even more stark. Research shows that people like to do business with people with similar backgrounds. Similar color, similar sex, similar educational backgrounds. People who go to the same universities end up working with the people with going to the other same universities. It's human nature that bias exists. You can't challenge it. But you, what you can do is you can be conscious about it and try to overcome it. And this bias is something that we want to be able to eradicate going forward. The numbers, again, are shocking. Less than 8% of women VCs are women. 8% I mean, of VCs are women in the US. Less than 3% are black and Latinos. And you look at these numbers, there's a direct correlation between lack of diversity in the venture capital industry to the funding that translates into startups women, black, Latino, Latina entrepreneurs in the US and in Europe. 
So what's the answer? What's the solution? How do we go after solving this? And also, how do we level this playing field? When we start having these conversations, the first question that comes to us is that, why do we need to level the playing field? I'll give you one answer, because it makes good business sense. It's proven that for every dollar of VC investment that goes to women founders, there are 2x returns compared to the same investment that goes to male founders. That's because women raise lower money, but still deliver the same returns in terms of top line. And ultimately, investing in women and minority entrepreneurs is, makes more business sense than anything else. This is a financial arbitrage opportunity that most people don't even realize. And oftentimes, they ask stupid questions like, are the ideas from women and minority entrepreneurs as good as men? We need to challenge that, and we need to level this playing field. So how do we do this? SAP takes a bold commitment today. We will invest up to 200 startups and more over the next five years with this initiative called SAP.io No Boundaries. And this is just the next five years on top of what we have done so far. For those of you who don't know SAP.io is, it's a mix of direct investments, VC investments, called SAP.io Fund that focuses on early stage ecosystem and a mix of accelerators that take zero equity across the globe. So with the SAP.io infrastructure, what we want to do is to, we want to commit up to 40% of the entire investable capital in our fund dedicated to women and minority entrepreneurs worldwide. And we believe this is going to make a huge difference in how we can change the access to venture capital in the industry. But you can't just solve the VC access problem without solving the other problems, like the mentor issue I mentioned. So what we want to do in terms of mentors for the, the women and minority entrepreneurs is that we want to leverage what we have with SAP.io foundries globally. We have accelerators in San Francisco, New York, Paris, Berlin, Tokyo, and Munich. And by the way, we're going to be in Munich, guys. So Munich's going to start up this year, so that's a big part of our commitment. In each of these foundries, there's going to be focus into inclusive entrepreneurship. And specifically, what we are going to do in Berlin and, San Fran and, and New York is that we're going to have even more focus. New York is all women and minority foundry all year long. Berlin, this year, in spring, we're going to run a dedicated cohort for women and minority entrepreneurs. And the reason why we are doing this is simple. We want to be able to provide access to customer, product, and technology mentors within SAP to help the women and minority entrepreneurs. SAP has nearly 400,000 customers, and we believe we can bring that power of the customer base to our startups, the minority uh, and women startups, and help them scale quickly. We also believe that by driving strong product integration between SAP products and the startup solutions, we can help these startups scale into the ecosystem by providing them access to our, our app center, which is the marketplace. And finally, we can provide technology mentorship for startups looking to build on SAP technologies. And then we come to the whole lack of diversity issue. SAP.io is probably one of the most diverse teams in the industry. And we believe with this diverse team, we can support the right startups in terms of providing them right feedback and advice. Let's talk about proof points, like why, why is SAP doing this and why, why, do you think, why do we think that we can make a difference? I want to talk about two companies. Plum is a company based out of Toronto. Caitlin McGregor is an amazing CEO. Plum is looking to go and find the right people for the right roles working with SAP success factors using AI and machine learning. And we are helping them scale into our ecosystem by helping them sell to our customers, having them part of our app center. That's really helping Plum scale very quickly in a very short period of time. The second one is Medal, and Lonnie is here today to talk about a little bit what she's doing. I'm incredibly proud to work with Lonnie and her team that's trying to change the face of healthcare in terms of getting access to data that's sitting in unstructured formats everywhere and helping change the way healthcare delivery is done. SAP is working with Medal to use the data, unstructured data, create structured reports that can be used for FDA filings for large pharmaceutical companies and reducing the time to market. 
Lonnie's going to tell you her story in, in a bit. And then you look at what we have done over the last two years since we started off, over 30% of our portfolio is led by women or minority founders, and we believe we have a framework to use to execute in terms of no boundaries and what we want to do with that. We're just getting started. We believe that the work that we have done so far over the two, first two years is just a small part of the pro, like, a solution. We think there's a long way to go, and that's what we want to do over the next five years in terms of getting to 200 startups. Ultimately, we want to build a world with no boundaries. And what we want to do is that we want to be able to go and create all, a, a inclusive network of startups that can work with us. SAP and SAP.io just can't do it by ourselves. We need all of you to be part of this journey. We need the business leaders, the venture capitalists, and the startups that are here to be part of a network. For too long in the technology industry, there has been an unconscious and inherent bias that's been manifested as racism, sexism, and broism. That's right, I said broism. So that broism, racism, sexism has to disappear. We need to take a big stand together. And if we do that, we can make a difference. I would like to stand in front of a set of minority and women entrepreneurs and tell them that everybody's got a shot and in winning in this marketplace, like the way I had a shot in being here today. I had an amazing CEO who had an opportunity to mentor me from the get-go, and I had an opportunity to get here. I would like to tell everybody that every, every one of you has an equal shot at being successful. But if I say that, I would be lying, because that's not true. There are these biases, challenges that exist every day, and we need to overcome them. And that's why I'm here to talk about SAP.io No Boundaries and here with a panel to discuss what we can do together. And I thank you for being part of this journey. And hopefully, together, we can remove the world and remove the boundaries in the world and make it real. Thank you. I think you can stay up with us, yes, uh, I will. Deepak. I will. And may I invite the other participants on stage? Good afternoon. It's great to be back uh, at DLD, and it's great to have such a, an impressive panel uh, here on stage. Thank you, Deepak, for your introduction, and thanks especially for providing the stats and figures uh, and the facts that we can talk about, uh, so that I don't have to repeat uh, that. That's wonderful. Um, to share something uh, with the audience, when we discussed, when we started to prepare um, the, the panel and started to discuss the topics that we'll cover today, um, one initial idea, you might have realized that now the panel is called Why I Investing in Diversity Matters. Uh, and I can share with you that uh, one other uh, wording that we had in mind uh, before that was Why Investing in Diversity Pays Off. Then we had an interesting discussion about that matter versus paying off uh, debate, and that's how I want to start the discussion here. You also made an economic argument uh, in your talk about diversity investing, and I'd like to, to enter the discussion with the question, is it actually smart to make economic arguments, or should we just focus on the moral, ethical imperative uh, of investing in diversity? Ankita, if you'd uh, like to start. Sure. Um, so in today's world, especially um, uh, in the world that I live in, I'm building a company in Asia, uh, which has customers in seven countries. Um, you know, we have employees from 15 nationalities. We're 50% female. Uh, it's... Um, uh, of course, the company is less than four years old. It's not like we ever sat back and said, hey, let's invest in diversity. Um, because we started in the, in, you know, so recently, it was such an obvious thing because uh, our customers are not 
male or of a particular ethnicity or a particular uh, you know uh, political leaning or anything our customers are diverse um, our uh, you know countries where the merchants we serve they are diverse so it it made no sense to focus on and stick to like deepak said the kind of people we get comfortable doing business with because that's actually not in the economic interest but the interesting point to note here is that uh, we actually didn't think about it at all it was so obvious Lonnie, um, similarly, um, you know, my, my background is that I um, was a third year in medical school, uh, ended up having patients that kept coming in without their medical records, um, eventually had one that ended up in a coma uh, as a result of this, and decided I'd move to San Francisco and try and find out why. Um, the experience that I had while I was there is that I actually got run over by a bus um, and then ended up spending several months um, in bed, making spreadsheets of waste in healthcare. I think when you're trying to solve a hard problem, the diversity of opinion, the diversity of experience is what makes that possible. And I'm, I'm often asked, you know, there were all of these companies that tried to do what you're doing, and how is it possible that your technology works when, you know, the 10 times we've tried before didn't? Um, and I, I would attribute that to having a, a diversity of uh, strengths. So bringing together people from different backgrounds, like it, it wasn't intentional, the makeup of the team, but having you know, the, the best person from a product background who's from one, one area and the best person from a security background who could understand how to get the data out. And um, that variability and actually having people that didn't think alike is why we were able to do something that other teams consistently had difficulty with. Um, and that's incredibly valuable. Thanks. Albert. Well, I, I'm very much in the camp um, that uh, Trudeau was in when he was asked at a press conference why half his cabinet is female. And he said, because it's 2015, next question. <laughs> I just think it's the right thing to do. And I think it's important that we don't burden this growing group of underrepresented entrepreneurs with extreme expectations, right? It's important that we don't go, oh, they now must really perform because we've invested in diversity. It's just, it's the right thing to do. They're gonna be setbacks. We should continue doing it. And the more we do it, the better it will be. Great. Deepak. I think there's both uh, a moral and a financial argument that are both equally compelling you need to find the right audience. So with some audience, the argument is a moral argument. The other audience, it's a, it's a financial argument. End of the day, what we need to do is eliminate the bias. So again, as part of this journey of launching SAP.io No Boundaries, I've been having conversations with a lot of people in the industry to help them understand what we're trying to do. And a lot of times people ask the question, are the ideas good enough? Mm -hmm. And then you realize like there's so much bias in this system that how can anybody come and ask if an idea is good enough, whether this is like a charity initiative. That is very, very demeaning for the women and minority entrepreneurs that we work with. So I think we need to have a bold stand in terms of both making the right moral argument, but also show the numbers and facts that shows that there's a financial arbitrage opportunity here. There are fantastic women and minority founders that deliver amazing returns and therefore it makes business sense. So find the right audience and make the right argument based on the audience. Yeah, great point. Um, maybe coming back, and I think we all agree that your initiative that you just presented on stage uh, is, is a big uh, leap forward. Um, and uh, let's discuss a little bit, uh, coming back to what can we do as part of the ecosystem. I'd like you two to um, give us some insights as entrepreneurs, what would you wish you had as support, support of whatever kind, when you started your journey? Now being uh, very successful in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, what do you see uh, other entrepreneurs lacking in terms of support, uh, whether that's moral support, uh, financial support whatsoever? Um, sure, so um, I think the first thing that I wish I had more of was uh, role models. 
um, just access to somebody who could, you know, who was who looked like me or spoke like me and behaved like me. It was like a global uh, uh, pioneer. Um, and not to say that there aren't enough, it's just that um, a guy my age with my ambition would have had a hundred and I maybe had to choose from two. Um, that, is, uh, that is difficult because people always find it easy to aspire to be something when they see it. Um, and uh, I certainly hope that we can be good role models in the future and uh, you know inspire a lot of um, young women and minorities, definitely. Uh, the other thing uh, I would like to touch upon is, um, you know, a lot of, uh, like, like I think Deepak hinted at that, right? A lot of um, investors, a lot of powerful people who um, tend to uh, be from one sort of category of humans. <laughs> I want to say, you know, white male, <laughs> so I'll say it. So uh, what ends I'm up happening... I'm a token white male. <laughs> <laughs> so what ends up happening is that uh, uh, everybody else has to do 15 on 10 of a job to prove that they are good to get whatever is 10 on 10. So you have to work one and a half times, two times as hard and as smart as everybody else to prove that uh, you're good enough and uh, you should be taken seriously. So I think once the power shifts a little bit, there's a little bit more diversity with where the power lies. Uh, it'll get easier on its own, uh, but until then, it'll be a, a, we have a lot of work to do. Thanks. <laughs> I, I would echo that. I've been incredibly lucky to have uh, a large number of mentors from a large number of backgrounds. So, um, you know, connecting pretty early in, in the journey of this company with Deepak and also um, you know, one of my major mentors is uh, a man named Hawk who founded Visa. And uh, I've been incredibly lucky in that regard. Um, fewer of them are women. But what I would say, and what I say is, like, you really do have to have a lot of backbone yeah. because the number, I mean, I had a, a pitch where I walked into the pitch and I, I go and I sit down and I tell them, you know, how my software performs and, you know, the, the metrics of success that we're getting for restructuring clinical data. And a guy in the room, like, slams his fist down on the table, stands up and goes, there's no way that this is true and cites a female entrepreneur who, um, I'm sure there's many male entrepreneurs who have overpromised and underdelivered on a product, and cites like the one female entrepreneur who did this in the healthcare space. And, uh, you know, basically like gets up and walks out and is like, all these other companies tried to do this, you know, how are you possibly doing this? And um, the number of times that that has happened or something like that and uh, the amount where you know you have someone who's like this is just not possible, and I was like, well, you know, you could run data through the software and just check. You know, it's 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 a verifiable thing. We have customers; they're using it. Um, and uh, I, I would say the biggest motivator is once you have a couple of those like really big success stories, and it's not whether or not people learn from failure or or missing out; it's whether they learn from anything else. So. You have all these investors that will like fail to see it until it is so, so much too late. And they will look at it after and be like, man, I had like 20 opportunities to invest in that and I totally missed it. And it was the biggest opportunity of my life. And I wish I hadn't stood up and been such a jerk. So I, I think that, that that is what will change it is you just have to have these, like you said, these role models who have like done it and then it's impossible to ignore. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing this. Uh, and uh, we, don't, we are not here to play a, a blame game, but um, the, let's just say diplomatically that the VC industry and the lack of diversity in the VC industry is part of the problem. I think we, we agree on that. Albert, can you share a little bit of what your perspective is on things that are changing, things that should be changing, and initiatives that you push forward? Yeah, I mean, um, at Unisco Ventures, we were sort of part of the problem. We were five white middle-aged guys for the longest time. Um, we've most recently added Rebecca Caden uh, as a partner. Um, I think it's so easy to think that there's not a problem. It's so easy to think that. And it's so easy to think you're not part of the problem, right? And there's a whole bunch of guys who stood up when this panel started and left, right? Because they think there's no problem. And 
or they don't want to hear about it, right? Uh, I've now backed three female entrepreneurs, and I can completely second the story you just told. Uh, one of these entrepreneurs works on a hard tech field, and she recently raised money, and the number of times people basically emailed me saying, we don't believe she has what she's saying. Meantime, this is being used in the field. It just blew my mind. I just, it's not something I would have believed previously. Do you feel that um, uh, the aspect of mentoring is as important as we discussed? Are you trying with Union Square Ventures to provide that in an extensive way? Yeah, form, so or? one thing we have is we have a team that's called the network team, and um, they've run now for several years a diversity and inclusion survey, training. Um, we have a women leadership program across all of our portfolio companies because that aspect is so important. I'd like to address one more question to you too. How are you, because you just said that you hope you also going to be a role model, and I'm sure you already are, uh, for a lot of female entrepreneurs. Um, what are you specifically uh, doing to kind of push that forward and to be a role model? Are there any things that you'd like to share? Um, sure. Um, so it begins, of course, at home. So uh, back at Zilingo and back in our uh, all of our offices, we are definitely very careful about uh, not just how women are onboarded, but how they're mentored and how they need to be told several times, sometimes not because of their own fault, that they can lean in and do more. Um, the women tend to be, uh, uh, you know, quite concerned about how their career path would be if they're not 10 on 10 or 15 on 10, which means that they'll make a checklist of saying, I'm not going to miss a single thing before I apply for this promotion or raise my hand for this other thing. So it's actually important to uh, teach them to unlearn uh, that because, you know, that's how their surroundings or their previous jobs have actually taught them to be, or universities in some cases. So uh, we uh, try to mentor and provide coaching to women differently from our male colleagues. and, and that certainly helps. Nani. Yeah, um, I, I would say in our organization, we're, we're about 50-50 in our leadership and, and in what we're doing. I, I wouldn't say that there's any particular different way we treat anyone. Um, we pick the best people. And uh, we pick people who are incredibly passionate. And uh, generally, everyone, everyone gets the same access and opportunities. Um, and you know, we, we work incredibly close. We're an incredibly tight-knit team. Um, I do, uh, it's funny, I've mentored a lot of, um, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs who are pitching. And I've, I've written pitches with them. I've coached them on how to deliver the pitches, how to answer questions. Um, one of the biggest things we can collectively do is to raise awareness. And I've seen it so many times now. Um, I can help two companies that look almost exactly the same write a pitch. The male founder will, on average, raise about two million more than the female founder. So I'll, I'll get like groups where they come in, and they're like, "We want to raise like three hundred thousand dollars." I'm like, "All right, okay, cool. Let's actually put this together for like three million dollars." And a lot of times, the male founders will end up raising five. Um, one key reason behind this is the questions that are asked, and I've seen it so many times. Um, specifically, when you have a, a male founder or a male employee, you tend to ask the question of. What does this look like in five years? How big are you going to get? How big can this get? How can you get there? Um, you know, what are you going to do next? Who are you going to work with next? When you get the women, a lot of times it's, how will you keep your little fiefdom? And how big of a moat can you build to avoid losing it? And so if you're asking those questions, you're never asking, you know, what, what are they doing next? Where are they going? How are they building something huge? And so it's the same kind of as the promotion mindset. It's the promotion versus the rule out. Um, one thing that women can do is attempt to answer the other question. It's still not as likely, but collectively um, actually being conscious about that. I had an investor who did this, um, and I pointed it out to him, and he he actually, like, it was a private feedback, but he got really scared and actually asked his lawyer to speak with me because I let him know that I had actually pitched him twice as a man and I had gotten funding both times. And as a woman, he wouldn't even invite me in to speak to him. And yet I had raised, like, I'd helped two companies raise a total of $10 million from the same person. And yet when I'm me, he doesn't, he's not even interested in meeting, he doesn't have time because I haven't, you know, it, it's not, yeah. my, my moat isn't big enough. He emailed me and asked me about my moat. So I think just having an awareness of that and sometimes when you're providing feedback, I actually think it's, it's nice to have it be 
private and that not to be like defensive, but it's something where you're trying to help the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, and I would say like, you know, instead of ruling something out, just check. You know, a lot of this stuff is actually verifiable. Yeah. So um, I found out uh, we just raised money from uh, a healthcare specific investor and they put a technical diligence team. They actually just talked to us and checked out the technology and talked to our customers. And um, I found out we had the highest technology diligence score they had ever seen in the industry. Hands down, they didn't have a single negative thing to say. They said it was the best diligence outcome they had ever gotten. And that guy who walked out, he's the one who loses because he, he rather assumed he never checked. So. And, and, and if you think those are all anecdotes, there's a great Harvard Business Review article where they classified the questions asked at that's, an open yes, pitch company. That's the one. That's and it's, you know, it, this is not anecdotes. This is real data it's that supports study. that this difference in questions is totally real. I'm so glad you read that. Yeah, thanks. Please circulate it more. It's, yeah. a, it's an amazing article. So we're nearly out of time, and I'd like to use the last two minutes for a, a short lightning round. Um, I think we all agree that there are a lot of measures um, we can take and there, that there are a lot of angles um, from where we can tackle the pro uh, problem. What do you think, what would, it, would be the one most impactful thing that the VC industry as a whole could do to tackle diversity in investment? One thing, one measure. Commit. Commit to investing certain percentage of your investable capital into women and minority entrepreneurs. Great. I would say diversify your decision making uh, ICs and you know committees, partnership. Maybe that'll help. So on the VC side. On the VC basically. side. Um, the whole reason that, that diversity helps is is that the way that the person thinks is maybe different than the industry. So if you're not seeing a solution to a problem, you should really be looking to different people. I, I think um, actually kind of when you meditate a lot, raising the level of awareness to the kind of reflex action that you take, take a step back and actually think about why, you know, why the things that you've tried before uh, maybe didn't work and how to try something different or actually listen to um, a different opinion and before reacting, um, you know, maybe take a little extra time to evaluate the, that um, different reality. Yeah, a strong second to that. I think change starts with each one of us. It's check your own behavior and when you see something, say something. This is a super micro example, but I went to visit a company the other day and um, every single one of their conference rooms was named after a male. And I said to the CEO, look, you know, and the CEO went like this, but nobody ever said it. So the simple fact that I said it, it's gonna change. So when you see something, say something. I think that's uh, great final words. Thank you so much to the panel and thanks for the great discussion. Thank you.